Welcome everyone to this uh, the second webinar about the, the National Solar Radiation Database. Uh, I am Manajit Sengupta, uh, and I will be giving the first part uh, of this webinar. I have two panelists who will be also be speaking, uh, Paul Edwards, uh, who will uh, be talking about uh, how to access the data from the NSRDB website, and uh, Galen McLaurin, who will also talk about uh, how uh, to use the API. Um, so just a few logistical uh, issues before we get started. Uh, please type in your questions, uh, and uh, once we are done with the presentations, we will try to answer as many questions as we can at the end. Um, we will ultimately answer all the questions and put it on the NSRDB website. Um, and the, also, the video of this presentation will be available from the NSRDB website. Uh, so that's the logistical piece, so now we can get going. What I'm going to talk about uh, initially in, my, in the first part is the about what is different in our version 3 of the NSRDB. A couple of years ago, we, we launched the NSRDB uh, and uh, I gave a presentation on the on the version 2. Uh, since then, we've updated the model, and uh, so I will just give a short overview of what has changed. Um, so uh, before we I, uh, dive into that, I just wanted to um, uh, uh, talk about, uh, for a few seconds, uh, about the, why we are doing what we're doing. Uh, we are essentially supporting the U.S. Department of Energy's goal of reducing uh, the cost of uh, solar deployment and financing. Um, and uh, as, ac as uh, uncertainty in solar radiation estimates is a, is a driver, uh, is a key driver of uh, uh, of the costs, uh, we our goal is to improve the accuracy in solar resource modeling. And this this is funded by the Systems Integration Sub Program of uh, DOE ERE Solar Energy Technology Program. Um, uh, as you all, as all of you might be quite aware, that uh, solar resource information is used uh, at all stages of a project development, uh, including uh, the pre-feasibility studies, uh, and exploring whether it's something that's feasible, the due diligence and acceptance, and finally, the operations and management of a project. Um, and uh, So the outline of this talk is uh, we're going to talk about how the NSRDB evolved uh, over time, uh, then the model we're using, the physical solar model, what's new in, in PSM version 3, a uh, quick uh, a summary of the validation efforts for this data set, uh, and, and also uh, would like to mention that we'll make uh, uh, available spectral data sets, and this is coming soon. Uh, finally, just uh, accessing the NSRDB and available and what available what parameters are available uh, and uh, that is uh, uh, what and the future work so that that is what I'm going to just talk about briefly um, so ev evolution of the NSRDB the NSRDB started as a, um, a essentially a model data set for uh, stations which were uh, uh, primarily airports where there were surface observations no solar radiation generally. It was mostly mm, cloud cover information from observers and other meteorological measurements. Uh, this cloud cover information was uh, translated into uh, um, a solar radiation estimate using the NETSTAT model, uh, and uh, the number of stations increased over time. Uh, and as you can see, we first had the 77 to 80, 61 to 90, 91 to 2005, when and then, the, then what has happened is since 98, uh, the satellite, the good quality geostationary satellite information started coming in. So once that come, came in, it opened up a new world, and we, we moved since then to the current version of the NSRDB, which is fully satellite-based uh, and covers uh, the period from 98 to 2016, soon to be 2017. The 2017 data will be released sometime this month. Um, and of course, like the data is available uh, from the NSRDB website. Um, 
So just a summary of what the physical solar model framework is. Um, on, on top, as you, these are uh, the sources of the data the, the we use. There is, of course, the geostationary satellite information. Uh, then there is MERA2, which is a NASA uh, model. Uh, there is data from uh, the polar orbiting satellite, MODIS. And then there's a, a snow and ice database, which we use. Uh, so the, the cloud properties, uh, uh, so just to mention that the physical, this model essentially has two steps. One is identifying what the clouds are uh, and, where, and uh, the cloud masks. And when we have a, cl a clear, uh, clear, we identify clear or cloudy. And when we have cloudy situations, we have the, we retrieve the cloud properties uh, using the GOES uh, information from the GOES satellite. That uh, the cloud properties ultimately end up in the in in the radiate transfer model. Uh, but in the radiate transfer model, what you would also need is uh, information about the atmospheric profiles, which comes from MERA2. Um, then for the clear skies, we need aerosols. Uh, the aerosol information comes from MERA2, uh, but uh, Essentially, uh, any any information in MER2, uh, is, is, which is a reanalysis data set, incorporates uh, the information which is essentially available from the MODIS satellite retrieval. So that's why you see the two arrows. Essentially, uh, MER2 includes the information from MODIS, uh, and we, we are using MER2 instead of using just MODIS directly. Uh, and then we have surface albedo, which comes from MODIS. We'll talk about it a little bit, um, and then we uh, the surface albedo from MODIS we have is a snow-free albedo, uh, so, and then there is another layer uh, which is the snow albedo we use when there is snow cover. So we get the snow cover from the uh, ice, ice, snow and ice data sets, and we use that uh, as another layer uh, when when we are doing our uh, our, our algorithms uh, calculations. Farms is our radio, fast radio transfer model. It takes all of this information and, and essentially calculates the GHI, DHI, and DNI. One thing to note is that uh, when we use the uh, phys physical solar model uh, and farms, we calculate the GHI and DNI directly as an output of this radio transfer model. This is slightly different uh, from uh, the regular semi-empirical models, which are currently in use uh, is, uh, in, uh, at other most commercial data sets, uh, where um, the GHI is first computed using the cloud indices, and then the GHI um, is, uh, is converted to a DNI and diffuse using a, a decomposition model. Uh, that's that's a, a difference uh, when, when, when we're able to use this radio transfer model directly with uh, all the input properties. Um, so what's new in PSM version three uh, so from version two? First thing is we used to have monthly aerosols uh, in version two, a monthly climatology. Uh, now we are using hourly aerosol optical depths from MERA, MERA2. Uh, so we essentially capture a lot of the variability in, in, in aerosols. Um, now earlier we had um, a climatological albedo, surface albedo. Uh, now we, we actually have a snow-free surface albedo from uh, from MODIS, uh, which is essentially this was this data set was produced by the University of Massachusetts Boston. Um, the, uh, then we have the snow cover from the integrated multi-sensor snow and ice mapping system, the IMS, uh, which is uh, a daily snow cover product produced by the National Snow and Ice Data Center. Uh, the next thing we what changed was that earlier, uh, as you may might be aware, that the GOES uh, you know, West satellite uh, has uh, essentially measures every uh, at the top of the hour and middle of the hour, while the GOES East satellite uh, measures at 15 and 45 past the hour. Uh, to, for consistency, we had to shift the data to make it um, at the top of the hour and middle of the hour. Earlier, we were shifting the solar radiation directly, uh, but now uh, what we changed was that we, we essentially shifted the cloud properties uh, and and uh, did the uh, instead of the solar radiation, uh, so that was a significant change. And finally, this uh, the ancillary data, the pressure, humidity, wind speed, etc. It's coming from Mera 2. Earlier, uh, it was coming from Mera, the previous version uh, of the of the reanalysis data sets. Um, 
so when we're comparing the mm, the versions, uh, so uh, here what you see is uh, a map uh, of uh, uh, on our, of average solar radiation, the DNI on on the left and the GHI on the right. The D, the version two is on the top and version three at the bottom. Uh, the most notable thing uh, you can see here is uh, essentially if you look at the DNI uh, from version two to version three, uh, the the southeast of the of the United of the U.S. Uh, has, there is a significant change where in the in the DNI resource, uh, where uh, and which essentially potentially makes uh, CSP technologies be, uh, viable in that area. Of course, there, this is subject to uh, more validation, but uh, apparently uh, from the change in in our mo in the model, which I described before, um, this is this is an impact of of, uh, of that. Um, so uh, another view on the validation of NSRDB, we we use surface measurements to validate our product, and in this case, we use the surfride network uh, because we essentially want to uh, use high quality data sets to do the validation. And Surfrad is operated by NOAA. It's a, it's a uh, well-known network with high-quality data, so we've used that data to do, conduct our validation. So here's one view of the validation, and on the left-hand side, uh, you see uh, is a plot from version 2, and on the right is a version 3. Uh, on the horizontal axis, uh, the, uh, it's a comp uh, is, a comp uh, is the time scales at which we do our validation. There's the hourly, the daily, the monthly, and the annual. Um, and on the vertical scale, it's uh, is overall uncertainty uh, uh, in percent. So, uh, w of course, uh, as as we look at hourly data, the uncertainty overall uncertainty is higher, and as you go to annual, it it goes down. Uh, the the difference we see between version two and version three is in the hourly um, uncertainty. Uh, the hourly uncertainty has has been significantly reduced. Uh, in, in version three from, from evaluation using the seven uh, sites across the country. Another view of the validation here, uh, and uh, uh, again here the, uh, we have NSRDB version two on the left and version three on the right. Uh, as you see on the horizontal scale, there these are all the, the seven stations uh, from Surfrad, uh, and on the uh, on the vertical scale. Uh, is the mean bias error as, as a percentage. Um, because we have, uh, uh, our model is uh, accounts for, physically accounts for clouds, we do, we can identify uh, situations which are cloudy and clear, so we can evaluate, uh, separate, segregate the cases into cloudy and clear, and of course we have the all sky. Uh, in this plot, the blue represents all sky conditions, the green bars represent uh, the cloudy conditions and the yellow represents the clear sky conditions. Uh, as you can see here, between version two and version three, there's a significant improvement in the bias in the cloudy situation. Uh, overall, the, for the clear sky situations, it remains pretty similar. Um, but uh, if you look at the uh, all sky conditions, uh, in in all cases, it is uh, lies between plus and minus five percent, except for Golden Creek, Mississippi, where it's slightly higher. Um, so accessing the NSRDB data, so what's available? Uh, so because Paul, Paul Edwards and uh, Gillen are going to talk about uh, how to access the data, I'm just, I will just mention what, what is available when you access the data. You can get, of course, the GHI, DNI, and Diffuse. Uh, there, is of course, there is also the Clear Sky, GHI, DNI, and Diffuse, which is available. Uh, other variables which are available are the cloud type, uh, and you can get dew point, the temperature, the pressure, humidity, the solar zenith angle, the precipital water vapor, wind direction, wind speed. Uh, as you can see, it's the, the variables marked by a single star uh, come from Meritu. Of course, they are downscaled and interpolated uh, to essentially match the four kilometer grid. Uh, because MERA is a, uh, a much lower resolution data set in terms of uh, spatial resolution. Uh, the ones which are marked by double star are recalculated using some MERA variables because they are not directly available from MERA2. 
So accessing the NSRDB, of course, uh, you, there are two ways to access the, the website. Of course, is nsrdb.nrl.gov, and there are uh, two two ways to access it. You could use the, the interface to, to to get data, and there is the API which can be used uh, to access our data sets. Um, now, coming to this new data set, we have capability we're going to provide. It's a new capability which will provide spectral plane of array. Uh, this will be on on demand. So when a user asks for a certain data, they could choose uh, uh, a location, and they will get one year of data. Uh, for and they could choose whether it's fixed tilt or a single axis tracking orientation. Uh, the the it uh, it'll be available for 2002 wavelength bands from 0.28 to 4 microns. Uh, what uh, and uh, what we're doing here is, in this uh, is that because we are trying to to calculate the plane of array, we essentially calculated radiances uh, at different sky view angles, multiple sky view angles, and these are integrated uh, based on whatever the plane of array is uh, to calculate the integrated uh, irradiance. Uh, and this, uh, as the, normally this problem is uh, uh, solving this uh, using the traditional models is extremely so. So we've developed the uh, a very fast model which essentially uses lookup table for the cloud transmittance, um, which has sped up uh, uh, the the computation and has enabled us to be able to make this data available um, on demand to the user. Uh, so, uh, so how does uh, given that this, we've developed this new model, the spectral model, uh, which is a fast model, we we just did some evaluation using measurements and also uh, the, 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 the slow but really accurate model called Libratran. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, a comparison uh, between LI-1800 in red, which is our measurements uh, using a spectral radiometer and the model, which is we call farms NIT. And as you can see, uh, in general, the, the uh, percentage error is, uh, is less than 1%. And if you look at the absolute percentage error through the whole spectrum, it's less than 5%. Uh, when we're looking at uh, comparing with Libra Trend, which is the the the, uh, the model which uh, which we this uh, Farms NIT was built on, um, the the percentage error is uh, less than one and a half percent, while the absolute percentage error again is less than four percent. So it and this is for on the right hand side. This is a comparison for. Uh, uh, for, for for these parameters where uh, zenith angle is 30 degrees and then optical depth is, is 10, it's for a cloudy situation. Um, so the the important thing is that the accuracy is pretty uh, pretty similar, is pretty high as as you can see from these two plots. Uh, but on the bottom, as you can see, marked out in red is the timing. If you use Libratran, the original model, it would have taken 500 seconds to do one computation. We brought that computational speed down to point and sped it up and brought it down to less than a second. Uh, so that is why we are able to process a year of data, uh, hourly data, and deliver it to you on demand. Uh, finally, uh, if you're using our data, uh, we request that we you cite this new paper we have published in Renewable and Sustainable Energy Reviews. Uh, uh, essentially, this. Uh, uh, citing our, our publication when you're using our data helps us um, explain to our funding agency uh, that uh, the usage of our data. So I would request you to please cite this, this new paper. This is our latest publication on, on the MSRDB. Uh, and thank you. And uh, I will now hand the, the, it over to Paul Edwards, who is going to talk about our interface. Um, So, Paul? Thank you. Um, give me just a moment to get my screen up. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Paul Edwards. I'm with the uh, geospatial data science team at NREL, and I've been involved in developing the NSRDB viewer web application, as well as the uh, data, data access APIs allowing 
programmatic um, access to downloads of the NSRDB data. I'd like to take a few minutes to give a brief presentation on the viewer itself, um, how to use it, and some of the um, some of the caveats and uh, useful bits of information while using it. So here is the viewer itself. It is a mapping application. It provides access to a array of useful data layers. You can see them in the list on the left. You can activate and deactivate data layers by simply checking them in the layer tree. The map is zoomable and panable, as you would expect from any Slippy Map app. Every layer includes metadata relevant to that layer, as well as the capability of downloading the source data behind the layer as a CSV file, shapefile, KML, or a GeoJSON objects. There's a legend providing details as to the data in being shown by the layer itself, units and whatnot, as well as some customizability here. You can adjust the transparency of a layer. You can um, turn on and off various uh, legend classes. And in some cases, uh, you can alter the color of certain legend classes. We also provide features for querying the data. Um, these uh, query fields include spatial queries, point, region, or a, a custom hand-drawn shape. Um, you know, useful if you wanted to query just a specific county or, or a, a non-linear geometric shape, as well as attribute queries where you can query for specific attributes within the data layer itself. For example, you know, show me all the records where the DNI is greater than a certain value, uh, et cetera. When all else fails, we also provide interactive tutorials for how to use the application. If you click the tutorials link in the upper right-hand corner of the application, you'll see this window and you can launch tutorials. Um, the tutorials we have available in the NSRDB data viewer are specific to the general GIS functionality of the application. There are not tutorials available for the specific download features that I'm about to show. So, the real interesting part of the NSRDB data viewer is the ability to access the NSRDB data. Um, when you select the download data tab in the upper left, you'll see this um, menu on the left drawer and it provides access to downloading either by a point or by a box. When you select either of these tools, the first thing you do is choose the location of interest. And here I'm showing uh, selecting a point. Um, if you were to draw uh, by region, you would be able to draw a box, rectangular or square. Um, once you've selected your region, we collect just a little bit of information. This is required for the downloads um, because the way our workflow goes, um, when you choose a download, the request is sent to the server, the server begins generating the archive, but because some of the download generation processes can take multiple hours to complete, um, it doesn't make sense to wait at the browser for that to complete. So instead, we will send you an email when that data is ready. And here's what the interface looks like. You have um, a flexibility in which years you would like to download, one or many. Um, the attributes that are available can be selected from. And at the bottom, there are a few additional options. Uh, the resolution of the data. Do you wish to convert the timestamps delivered from UTC into uh, the local time of the data itself? And so when you've made your selections, here we're showing the attributes that can be downloaded. So this is an important um, concept to understand. And I probably answer minimum of half a dozen questions a week from users looking to find out how they can download more data. And so our download APIs are limited um, to certain rate limits per user and as well as certain size limits per request. These limitations are really defined by the capacity of the hardware that we're running, um, taking into account the number of you know, users we have on a given day. And so these populars or these services are very popular. We get tens of thousands of requests a day. The data sets are, are massive. And so pulling out slices of the data is quite um, performance heavy on these servers. And so we have rate limits in place to ensure that essentially we don't crash the servers um, 
and and have you know a few large downloads taking up all of our processing time. This uh, download limit indicator in the web application provides a visual indicator. As you make your selections, you will notice it going up and down. So if you are choosing all of the years, it will jump up. If you deselect all of the years and only choose a single year, you'll see it drop down again. Um, the same for choosing attributes. Uh, also for uh, choosing a half hour interval versus a 60 minute interval that will, um, you know, half hour intervals is double the data from 60 minute. And so that will, that will double the, the uh, amount of data. You know, if you choose a 60 minute interval, you can choose twice as many attributes or twice as many years, for example. Um, so this is the new data set. And so I wanted to take a moment to highlight the Spectral On Demand download tab. Um, there are multiple data sets available, PSM v3, v2. The Spectral On Demand is a new one. It hasn't been released yet. Um, Manajit talked about the, the data itself. I just wanted to take a moment to show off the slightly unique aspects of the download tool. Um, there is no um, size limit bar for spectral because spectral is only available for a single pixel at a time so no spatial no regional downloads of spectral data only a single point at a time and um, that is again due to server hardware limitations when you're downloading spectral there's also no uh, selection of attributes we have to pull all of the PSM attributes to use as input to the spectral generation process and since we have that data in hand or in memory already, we go ahead and put it in the CSV file that we provide for download. So you get all of the PSM v3 data, as well as the spectral generated data in that download. Um, and so what it comes down to is you select the year you would like your data for, and then you can choose either a fixed tilt system, in which case you have to enter in the tilt and azimuth of the panel, or you can choose a one axis tracking system, in which case there are no additional inputs because um, the tilt and azimuth are calculated dynamically. So without regard for which data set you're choosing, the, the end game is the same. You click the download data button, you receive a little pop-up that explains that you will be receiving an email in time when your download is ready. This is an example of what that email would look like. Um, for downloads whose size is less than about 130 gig, you will receive a link that will take you to a direct download of the data archive, whether it's a, a single CSV file or dozens of CSV files, it'll be one big zip file. For really big downloads, greater than 130 gig, we use Globus Connect. Globus Connect is uh, simply a service um, that provides uh, you know, streaming downloads with um, the ability to restart where you broke off. It's similar to an FTP service or a, or a torrent service. It um, simply provides a more reliable download for very large downloads. Instructions are provided in the email. You click the link and it takes you and it has everything you need to know. So the data format, um, I'm not going to go into the, the details of the data format. All of this is documented in our API documentation and on the NSRDB website. Um, but we do follow the standard SAM format. Um, and in addition to these data, uh, the spectral download follows the same format, but it includes the 2000 spectral um, data points per time slice. And um, that is all I have to say. Uh, thank you for your time. And I'll now hand the presentation over to Galen. Using Okay, so I'm going to now walk you through uh, the API, which is another way to download the NSRDB data. We're going to use Python. So uh, just to show you to access um, example of these data on the NSRDB website, if you go to data sets, there's an API instruction. And in here, um, this is the HTML document that's generated from a um, Jupyter notebook. I just wanted to quickly um, highlight this page, the NSRDB API information. 
So in that, you can see information about the different data sets, um, focusing on TSM version 3. Um, so this is set up like a, a standard API. Um, right here are the parameters that you will need to pass through the API and um, their values and descriptions of each that we'll be using in this, this demo. Um, you can download in JSON format um, or CSV. CSV is probably uh, going to be the more common option for most users. And that's what we're going to use um, in this example. So what I'm going to do is a, a live demo with the Jupyter Notebook. So I'm going to open up um, this example, Jupyter Notebook. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a, a way to um, programmatically download different locations using the NSRDB API, and then also show you how to seamlessly uh, interface with the SAM API to um, estimate the system performance for a particular uh, PV system. So the first thing you'll need to do is get an NSREB API key. So the link is right there. You'll just sign up. Um, and then you'll also uh, register for SAM and you can download the, um, the SAM API. So we can just walk through this. So it uses very standard libraries. You won't have to set up a complex Python environment to use this. Um, here's a, the, the inputs that you'll need to feed into the API, so you can just put in a lat long that you want in the year that you're interested in downloading, and it will find the closest NSRDB pixel to that, uh, to those coordinates. Um, and then you'll put in your API key that you want to download, and then here you'll set in, uh, you'll set up the attributes that you want to download, so from the list available, um, in this example we're just going to download the irradiance, so um, GHI, DHI, DNI, and then wind speed uh, and air temperature, which are necessary for calculating the system performance using the SAM uh, model. And then we'll also just download the solar zenith an uh, angle to have that. Um, the API allows you to download the data, um, including the leap year or, or without the leap year. So if, if, you know, for example, 2012, if you set this as false, it will remove that year. If you put it as true, it'll include it. Um, that's not necessary for non-leap years. Uh, the interval, just like Paul was explaining on the viewer, you can specify either 30 or 60 minute intervals. Um, and then for the time, you can also specify in UTC or in local time. So we're going to use UTC equals false, and that will give us the data in local time, which is what we will need to feed it into the SAM API. And then just some information about you. Um, this is really important for us so we, so we know who's using the, the NSRDB, um, how they're using it, and this helps us secure uh, follow-on funding to continue this project. Okay, so moving on to actually making the, the, the API call. So um, this is pretty much just using simple string formatting in Python to create uh, the URL using all that information. So if you get like a bad request, it just means that you didn't set up your, your parameters properly um, in this first section. So what we're going to do here, the way this returns uh, the data is in, it's pulling in a CSV format. It's going to have a header, and then the first row is going to have your metadata. So we're going to just pull that first. Well, this is the danger of doing a live demo. It looks like, um, unfortunately, we just had the server go off line for a second. We'll be doing a couple uh, server maintenance up, uh, changes uh, yesterday and today. Um, but I'm just going to walk through the, the other pieces of these. So um, the next part that we're going to do is, is pull down um, the actual time series data. So you do the exact same call again using that URL. We're going to skip um, the first two rows that had that metadata, and this will get us to the actual time series data. And so as you can see here, um, this is a standard pandas data frame, um, and the index is the is a standard uh, date time uh, format. And so as you can see, I've pulled down the 30-minute data, and this gives me the actual uh, the, the time index and the variables that I requested. So uh, the... The benefit of having this API is it allows you to um, to do this programmatically and do it much more faster. Uh, do it much faster than if you had, for example, a couple thousand locations that you wanted to pull using the viewer. Um, that would that would be a little onerous. And so this allows you, you can just take this code and you can put it into a for loop that'll loop through all of your locations. A lot of uh, 
users in industry and researchers um, have done this uh, to pull specific locations. And then um, you have the data if you want, you know, all of the variables. And then in this example, I'm going to show you the next step that a lot of users have been um, uh, doing to estimate the system performance using the SAM uh, module. So SAM is a system advisor model. It's developed at NREL. Um, there's actually a, uh, a webinar that the SAM team is going to be giving later on today. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about SAM, um, you can go to sam.nrel.gov and um, you can see them for more information there. I'm going to walk you through a basic example of how we would take the time series data we've just downloaded for this location um, over Golden, Colorado, and then we're going to we're going to set up a simple fixed axis um, array system and estimate uh, the generation of it. So you'll just um, download the the SAM API and and set it up on your system, and then you'll just import this SSC API. Um, module in Python, and then um, you create the SSC object. This is your API um, object that you'll be using to interface um, with the model. So what we do first is we create this, this weather file data, um, and this includes the location, the, um, the temporal components, the temporal indices, and then the, the, the four weather variables that we need. So we need direct um, normal radiance, diffuse, wind speed, and, and air temperature. So we'll feed those four variables into the SAM object and we create this weather file object. And then what we do is we pass that into a data object. So we're gonna create um, the data object. It's gonna be a solar resource data type. Uh, the, SAM, um, the SAM model also has uh, a lot of other different technologies, others um, such as CSP, um, wind power, and um, so you'll, you'll specify specifically that's what we're using here. Um, then we're going to, basically what you want to do is just take these examples and follow on the way that the SAM module um, is set up. So we're going to free that weather data since we're done with it and we've now passed everything into this data object. So now what we can do is we can set up the system uh, configuration of this, this fixed tilt PV um, system that we're going to model. So the first thing is to specify the capacity in megawatts. So we're going to model a four megawatt system. Um, then we set up all of the basic components. This is a, a very simple model. SAM also has a much more detailed PV model. If you want to model with a lot more complexity, um, the, the specific system. But so in this, we're just going to set the, the DC-AC ratio, uh, the tilt, azimuth, inverter efficiency, some losses and then the array type. So in this model, we can do a fixed array, which is what we're going to model here, but you can also do a fixed roof, um, a one-axis tack tracker, back tracker, and a two-axis tracker. Set our ground, cursor, uh, ground cover ratio, and then we can also set any constant um, adjustments to it. Um, and then the last piece here is to simply specify the, um, the model that we're going to use, which is PV Watts version 5. Like I said, this is the simple PV model. And then we just simply run it and estimate our generation. So um, once you have run it, you can pull out a lot of different variables. Um, we're just interested in generation at this point. Um, so the capacity factor for this is 17.1% across the year for this specific system in Boulder and Golden, Colorado. And then um, there is the actual generation. Um, and then just um, the last thing here is it's helpful to, to look at what the data looks like. So it's just a simple plotting function that I've set up in. Here, I'm just going to plot the um, data and the generation for April 16th. So as you can see, um, this golden line, that is the generation that we estimated with SAM, and then the other variables being the GHI, DNI, and DHI. Okay. So um, I think this, this just gives a lot of extra f flexibility for, for users that want to essentially batch runs for specific locations across the country. And again, if you um, want to learn more about SAM, check out their website and participate in the webinar later on today. Thanks. So now we will move on, take questions. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I do have, the, I see the list of questions here, and I'll try to answer some of them uh, right here. Um, so there is a question about uh, how reliable is it to calculate solar radiation using latitude and altitude. I do not fully understand the question, um, uh, but if you could, if you are willing to send us more details uh, to our email, uh, srdb 
uh, at enrol.gov. Uh, we can look into answering your question. The next one is, can I use your database uh, or the NASA database to compare with parameters? Of course, you can use our uh, data and compare with parameters. One thing, uh, caveat is you need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that a satellite covers uh, a, a spatial extent, which is, uh, in our case, four kilometers, while a parameter is sitting at the ground. So there's some averaging which we might require uh, to, on, on your parameter data to essentially uh, kind of pseudo-estimate some uh, spatial smoothing. So that's, uh, and uh, that is what we've done. If you, if you look at any of our uh, MSRDB validation, I think there is uh, uh, information about how we do these validations using uh, information from parameters. Um, next is, will NSRDB cover Guam and Saipan? Um, I think Guam and Saipan are at the edges of the satellite. We, I don't think it is. This, this satellite, the GOES satellite, uh, may not be. We'll, we'll look at it, at it once more, but from what I know, that we do not have the coverage from the GOES satellites. I think it's the Japanese satellite, MTSAT, which has a better coverage, but we do not uh, produce data using MTSAT, so we do not, unfortunately, have Guam. But we, I, because you raised the question, we'll definitely look, have another look at it. Um, is that all data is included in the NSRDB? No, it is not. What we are including currently in there uh, and this, uh, in the NSRDB is uh, primarily uh, the output and the variables which are needed for downstream modeling. Um, and I understand this question about the available to aerosol data. Um, but uh, I, and this similarly, there's another question I see later on about the albedo data. Uh, so, uh, again, this makes our database even bigger, supplying that data, but we will look at into it and maybe even this is, uh, we'll look at this and, and see if we can do that. Um, is there any known bias error in version 3? Uh, this is answered as I showed uh, the, in, in our plots. There is, uh, depending on locations, oh, there are some biases, but again, it is not necessarily a single uniform bias you can have. It will depend on the location, the cloud type, how often it is cloudy or clear. Uh, we do not, uh, our data sets are not bias corrected in any way. We do is we run our data sets with the inputs and provide you the information. Site adaptation and those type of methods would probably use any bias, but we do not correct the data. Uh, it is just what we produce. Um, Next is, does this mean new set of TMIs are being released? So uh, as you might realize that every year as we um, update our data sets, we produce a new TMI by including that, that year. Uh, so 12, once we, we provide the 2017 data set, we will produce a new TMI, which will include the 2017 data uh, and, and release that. Uh, so, the, so every year as we add a day year, we'll, we'll create a new TMY. Um, next question is, what is the accuracy of spectral model on a cloudy day? I showed an example which is uh, like less than 5%. The, the one thing to realize is uh, it's not the accuracy of the spectral model which drives this. It is the accuracy of the, of the input uh, parameters of the cloud optical depth. So that is the uncertainty which you have, uh, so the spectral model per se is accurate, but not, uh, um, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily, the, it's not the model, it's mostly the inputs about how, of the, or the properties of the clouds. Um, next is uh, albedo data, this, uh, I've answered that. Is there a way to, when it properly says intraday variation? So the data is available every half hour, is half hourly data. Um, so you could download half hourly data for whatever period of time you want to. So and then take take that data set and assess intraday variation uh, if you'd like to. Uh, but notice note that the data is 
is is half hourly. We, it's not more at a higher frequency than that. Uh, we have the new satellite. I just want to make a point that the new satellite goes 16, which is we we are working on. It will have five minute data at two and um, two kilometer resolution. That's what we're going to produce. Uh, of course, we'll continue with our uh, uh, with our uh, with our uh, uh, with our regular data set. Uh, but then we will also uh, try to make high resolution data available to the user. Um, next question is I've noticed you enroll international database within the viewer has a specific coverage, yet if search for countries are not covered, you definitely have that coverage, but it's part of NREL ready viewer. Yes, that is a separate effort, but not part of the NSRDB. Uh, so the ready viewer to do you have yeah, I can talk just quickly the the, the ready viewer is, is, a, is a separate project um, and when it, the NSRDB covers the area we will use the NSRDB but otherwise we have to use other sources so um, we've used PVGIS um, European platform um, and then in other places we've actually had to purchase data so the the ready um, usually you can download that data, but it um, it's not the NSRDB unless stated, and so just con take into consideration that it's not necessarily the same quality of data either. Okay, so the next question is, can we find info of radiation from an equatorial place? I'm working in Colombia and want to validate forecasting models versus radiation field data. So our data coverage goes from Canada up to pretty much all of Brazil, so Colombia is part of the database. Um, so you definitely, if you're working in Colombia, you do have access to data for Colombia through the NSRDB. It goes all the way through southern Peru. Yes, so so there is data for Colombia, definitely available half hour, four kilometer. Uh, next question, how can we download the data using the latitude and longitude of the particular location? I think. Uh, Paul Edwards can answer this question. I think there's a tab at, on that map uh, on the right-hand corner where you can click and enter your latitude and longitude. But Paul, can you just answer this question? Yeah, so f from the from on the viewer, it really is just a point-and-click um, methodology. But if you use the APIs, uh, the APIs actually do accept spatial parameter. You can use um, any any kind of polygon or multipoint or or single point, as long as it's formatted as well known text, and pass that into the API, and uh, we'll post the links to the documentation for these APIs along with the rest of the webinar contents at the end. Okay. Next question is: Is there an update to typical meteorological year data? Um, it will accompany the release of the 2017 data, so we will have an update to the TMY. Uh, data from other parts of the world. Right now, we cover uh, only Canada up to the up to like Peru. Uh, that's that's our coverage for now. In India. And we do have some data which for India. This is part of a separate project, but that data is only available from two, year 2000 to 2014, uh, and uh, there is currently no plans to update that data set. That's 10 kilometer hourly data, but there is no plans to update that data. And it's a different methodology, so... It is not the PSM method. It is a different, it's a semi-empirical method. Uh, it was, came out of a separate project. Uh, the, the, the current, the, the, while we will update the ghost satellite based products, uh, that data remains static, but it's available from the MSRDB. Next question, is it possible to have GHI checked by default for PSM3? Good question. I think we, right now, what we have is uh, our default check is for SAM, uh, but uh, I will talk with the team and see if, if that's, it's, it's easy to do, uh, but uh, is, if there is any other logistical concerns, but otherwise, uh, well, we will take your suggestion. Yeah, if you're, um, if I could interject real quick, if you're using the API and you don't supply any list of attributes at all, then by default it returns all available attributes, and so that would be one way around that problem that currently exists uh, through the API at least. 
So, so yeah, this is the, these. I guess these questions are probably them primarily from the website. Like even the people are using True. the website. True. Yeah. Yeah. So, but we'll look at it. We'll, we'll definitely see if that's we can do that. We'll, we'll just. Uh, uh, but I. Uh, but it's it's a good suggestion. Um, for our, okay, next question is perhaps this was mentioned already, but what's the data resolution version three? Is the same as version two? It's uh, it's four kilometer every 30 minutes, um, and uh, we will continue to produce update at that resolution. Like you mentioned, for the new GOES satellite, we have two kilometer five minutes. We are working on trying to figure out whether we can also deliver that high resolution data in parallel. As you might realize, uh, our current holdings are uh, two terabytes a year, uh, but that will grow to 48 terabytes a year once if we do two kilometer uh, or five minutes. So we have two million pixels, which will become eight million pixels, and of course, six times the vol volume in terms of time. So a factor of 24 increase, but we are still trying, we will try to make it available. Um, next question is I've compared 30 minutes versus 60 minute files. 60 minute file seems to be the same as 30 minute files, but truncated. Keeping only our 30 is the reason for this instead of having averages. Um, so uh, we do uh, do not do, we realize that there is a method where you could essentially do a weighted average, but we leave it to the user to do it. Uh, here it is only a choice. Again, uh, our data is an instantaneous data. There is no averaging in this case, uh, so that uh, because it's. The user can easily average it out, but if we, we start doing averages, users will not be able to back out the instantaneous actual data. So that, that is a decision we have made. Uh, essentially, I do realize that an averaging uh, might even improve, uh, the, the, uh, reduce the uncertainty you, you see, but uh, this is a conscious decision and uh, and so we just expect the user to do their own averaging. So uh, the next question is, this is significant for users who may rely upon this data to develop and build solar projects, and when therefore potential over predict by around 3% of this complicated industry are the efforts to reduce the bias in new releases. Uh, Again, um, like I said, the bias, we will only be driving down the bias, uh, try to drive down the bias by uh, having better inputs to our models. We will not do bias corrections to our data sets. Uh, we do provide um, validation. We, we, we publicly have, we provide reports uh, which are available from the NREL website um, on the validation. Uh, and uh, we do present it at various forum, uh, the plots I showed, uh, which essentially shows what biases. But again, these are only for a few locations. As, as you see, that uh, there are some locations with higher bias, some locations practically zero bias. Um, and uh, uh, again, this would be something which a user will have to take the ground data and 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 do a co-located site adaptation to. To get to those biases, we will not do a. Uh, we do not want to do a blanket bias correction to our data sets because that because a user might want to do it on their own in their own method, and it defeats the purpose uh, of the, allowing the user to do to the, apply their own methods. And we don't have enough high quality ground stations to to do a bias correction across the data set. It make it better in a few places and worse in others. It's possibly, and we'll never know. Uh, yeah. So that is the risk we take if we do a blanket bias correction. Um, uh, can we get a download data in the foreign format as shown in previous Excel for TMY data? I don't think uh, we will be able to do that. Uh, you'd probably be have to write your own script to transform it to any older format you have. Uh, I don't think that's something uh, we will be doing. Um, that the formats we have are what we have, but adding more formats just creates more logistical challenges for distributing the data. So it would not be something we are planning on. 
Uh, so I think I've answered all the questions, but if you did this, uh, again, this reiterate, this webinar will be posted uh, on the NSRDB website. Uh, and also, if you have further questions, please free, feel free to contact us. We'll try to answer your questions uh, the best we can. Um, and uh, there are some more questions there. Oh, so there are a few more questions which have come in, uh, I, which I don't see on my screen, but which has been pointed to out by my colleague. Uh, just, is the system able to track infrared at night? We do not provide infrared data. Of course, we use the infrared channel for retrieval, um, but uh, we, of course, uh, we're providing solar radiation. So infrared, there is uh, there is no solar radiation. So I, so I do not fully understand uh, what your question is driving at, so please send us an email. I would point them to the Black Marble. is a product by NASA that has nighttime lights, and they have a lot more detailed data now that would include infrared at night. So what is the estimated timeline for update of future years, 2017? Okay, that's a good question. We, we Our goal is to do an annual update, and the annual update will timing is probably in the um, August-September time frame. Uh, because uh, we will get the data after the year is complete, and then we get all our data sets, process everything. So the, ultimately, it will always be available eight to nine months uh, late. Uh, so that's it. so always like the 2017 update. 2017 update will be appear will appear by the end of this month, and expect that for future years. Uh, the validation didn't use many stations given the climatic diversity years. Are there high quality data sets which could be used for validation? Um, I will check on the uh, other. There are other sources of data. Well, the big challenge is, is we really need high quality data. There's a couple of other stations I didn't show. We've done validation on. It is our own NREL uh, station. And there is the, uh, the ARM climate change, uh, uh, the, the USDOE climate change program, uh, which has a site in Oklahoma. We did validation there. Uh, definitely, the, the, the most important thing is that we need data for long term. So a couple of years, three years, five years data is not something we'd want to use for validation. We do need, also need data from like around 20 years of data when you conduct a validation. So again, there might be other data sets available for the short term, <coughs> but we exclude it from our validation. Um, main sources of bias in the new version, PSA, uh, version CPSM. Of course, it's it's the main source of bias. It's clear skies. It's obviously, the if there's a positive bias, it's the input, the aerosol uh, input parameters might have. Uh, it's uh, it's we're lower than it actually is. Maybe that's what is happening. Cloudy skies, same thing. It's all the inputs which draw uncertainty. The inputs which drive it. If we have too thick a cloud, then we have a, a low bias. Uh, if too thin a cloud, it has high bias. So that's those are the things which drive the uncertainty. A copy of the PowerPoint to participants or an accessible link to the 2018 paper. Uh, the paper we can. Uh, but are we allowed to, because this is a poll? We can point to the link we on the, point yeah, the I link. think it, we, need, we need to update the publications list. So yes, we'll do that. We will do that. On the NSRB website. Yeah, and and uh, this webinar will be available. Uh, maybe we can also provide a PDF of the presentation. Yeah. We'll do that. Uh, finally, I do use this for Columbia as well and works nice. Okay, great. That's good to hear. I'm hoping to use NSRB for modeling water temperatures in rivers in Northwest California. We have a lot of coast. Probably not the best place, best data sets to use for that, uh, for doing anything. The, the solar radiation is primary. The rest are from there too. I would suggest you use other sources of data. Uh, if you want to contact us, uh, I could provide you some suggestions of what else to use. But please, uh, uh, the NSRDB is probably not the best data sets for, for modeling water temperature. So I think uh, we are out of time, we just, uh, so I need to wrap up at this point, but I think I've answered most of your questions. But again, if you have any further questions, please free, feel free to contact us. And I really appreciate our time and, uh, and uh, appreciate that, that you are using our data and are in, sufficiently interested in our data. Ultimately, um, you know, our users uh, drive uh, this product. 
if we don't have users, we do not have a product because ultimately it is funded by the U.S. taxpayer. Uh, so that so we really appreciate your using our data and having confidence in that. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, and have a good day.